Hey people, it's Nas talking. Now this is an old article from about 2008, and I'm reading halfway through it so I can get the relevant piece. So here it goes. In the greatest movement of people the world has ever seen, China is secretly working to turn the entire continent into a new colony. Reminiscent of the West's imperial push in the 18th and 19th centuries, but on a much more dramatic, determined scale, China's rulers believe Africa can become a satellite state, solving its own problems of overpopulation and short of the natural resource, resources at stroke. With little fanfare, a staggering 750,000 Chinese settled in Africa over the past decade. More are on the way. The strategy has been carefully devised by officials in Beijing, but one expert has estimated that China will eventually need to send 300 million people to Africa to solve the populations of overpopulation and pollution. The plans appear on track. Across Africa, the red flag of China is flying. Lucrative deals are being struck to buy its commodities, oil, platinum, gold, and minerals. New embassies and air routes are opening up. The continent's new Chinese elite can be seen everywhere, shopping at their own expensive boutiques, driving Mercedes and BMW limousines, sending their children to exclusive private schools. The pothole roads are cluttered with Chinese buses taking people to markets filled with Chinese goods. More than a thousand miles of new Chinese railroads are crisscrossing the continent, carrying billions of tons of illegally logged timber, diamonds and gold. The trains are linked to ports dotted around the coast waiting to carry the goods back to Beijing after unloading cargoes of cheap toys made in China. Confucius Institute's state-funded Chinese cultural centers have sprung up throughout Africa, as far afield as the tiny landlocked countries of Burundi and Rwanda, teaching baffled local people how to do business in Mandarin and Cantonese. Massive dams are being built, flooding nature reserves. The land is scarred with giant Chinese mines, with slave laborers being paid less than one pound a day to extract ores and minerals. Pristine forests are being destroyed, with, Chinese, with China taking up to 70% of all timber from Africa. All over this great continent, Chinese presence is swelling into a flood. Angola has its own Chinatown, as do great African cities such as Dar es Salaam and Nairobi. Exclusive EAD compounds serving only Chinese food and where no blacks are allowed being built all over the continent. African cloths in commerce are sold in the markets on the continent, or now almost always imported, bearing the legend Made in China. From Nigeria in the north to Equatorial Guinea, Gabon and Angola in the west, across Chad, uh, Sudan in the east, in South Zambia, Zimbabwe and Mozambique, China sees like a vice-like grip on a continent which officials have decided is crucial to the superpower's long-term survival. The Chinese are all over the place, says Trevor Nakube, a prominent African businessman with publishing interests around the continent. If the British were our masters yesterday, Chinese have taken their place. Likened to one race deciding to adopt a new home on another planet, Beijing has launched its so-called One China and Africa policy because of crippling pressure on its own natural resources in a country where the population has almost tripled from 500 million to 1.3 billion in 50 years. China is hungry for land, food and energy. While accounting for a fifth of the world population, its oil consumption has risen 35-fold in the past decade and Africa is now providing a third of it. Imports of steel, copper and aluminium have also shot up with Beijing devouring 80% of world supplies. Fueling its own boom at home, China is also desperate for new markets to sell goods. In Africa, with non-existent health and safety rules to protect against shoddy and dangerous goods, is the perfect destination. The result of China's demands for raw materials and sales of products in Africa is that turnover in trade between Africa and China has risen from £5 million annually a decade ago to £6 billion today. And keep in mind, this was 2008. This is out of date. However, there's a leap of price to pay. There's a sinister aspect to this invasion. Chinese-made warplanes roll through, roll through the African sky, bombing opponents. Chinese-made assault rifles and grenades are being used to fuel countless murderous civil wars, often over the materials the Chinese are desperate to buy. Take, for example, Zimbabwe. Recently, a giant container ship from China was due to deliver its cargo 3 million rounds of AK-47 ammunition, 3,000 rocket propelled grenades and 1,500 mortars to President Robert Mugabe's regime. After an international outcry, the vessel, the and Yu Jiang was forced to return to China despite Beijing's assistance that the arms consignment was a normal commercial deal. Indeed, the 77-ton armed shipment would have been small beer, a fraction of China's help to Mugabe. He already has high-tech Chinese-built helicopter gunships and fighter jets to use against his people. Ever since the US and Britain imposed sanctions in 2003, Mugabe has courted the Chinese, offering mining concessions for arms and currency. While flying regularly to Beijing as a high-ranking guest, the 84-year-old dictator rants at small dots such as Britain and America. He can afford to. Mugabe is orchestrating his campaign of terror from a 25-bedroom pagoda-style mansion built by the Chinese. Much of his estimated $1 billion, $1 billion pound fortune is believed to have been siphoned off from Chinese loans. The imposing grey building of Zanu PF, his ruling party, was paid for and built by the Chinese. Mugabe received £200 million last year from a loan from China, enabling him to buy loyalty from the army. 
In another disturbing illustration of the warm relations between China and the aging dictator platoon, the China People's Liberation Army has been out on the streets of Motari, a city near the border of Mozambique, which voted against the president in the recent disputed election. Almost 30 years ago, Britain pulled out of Zimbabwe, as it had done already out of the West of Africa, in the wake of Harold Macmillan's Wind of Change speech. Today, Mugabe says, we have turned east when the sun rises and given our backs to the west where the sun sets. Despite Britain's commendable colonial legacy of a network of roads, railways and schools, the British are now being shunned. According to one veteran diplomat, China is easier to do business with because it doesn't care about human rights in Africa, just as it, care, just as it doesn't care about them in its own country. All the Chinese care about is money. Nor is that more true in Sudan. Branded Africa's killing fields, the massive oil-rich East African state is in the throes of the genocide and slaughter of thousands of black non-Arab peasants in southern Sudan. In effect, through its supplies of arms and support, China has been accused of unwriting humanitarian scandal. The atrocities in Sudan have been described by the US as the worst human rights crisis in the world today. The government of Khartoum has helped the feared Janjaweed militia to rape, murder and burn to death more than 350,000 people. The Mafa. The Chinese, who now buy half of all Sudan's oil, have happily provided armored vehicles, aircraft, and millions of bullets and grenades in return for lucrative deals. Indeed, an estimated one billion dollars, one billion pounds, of Chinese cash has been spent on weapons. According to Human Rights First, a leading human rights advocacy organization, Chinese-made AK-47 assault rifles, grenade launchers, and ammunitions for rifle and heavy machine guns are continuing to flow into Darfur, which is located of giant refugee camps, each containing hundreds of thousands of people. Between 2003 and 2006, China sold Sudan $55 million worth of small arms fighting and United Nations weapons embargo. With new warnings of the cycle of killings intensifying, an estimated two-thirds of the non-Arab population has lost at least one member of their families in Darfur. Although two million families have been uprooted from their homes in the conflict, China has repeatedly forwarded United Nations denunciations of the Sudanese regime. While the Sudanese slaughter has attracted worldwide condemnation, promoting Hollywood filmmaker Steven Spielberg to quit as artistic director of the Beijing Olympics, few parts of Africa are now untouched by China. In Congo, more than two billion dollars, two billion pounds have been loaned to the government, and a goal of three billion pounds has been paid in exchange for oil. In Nigeria, more than five billion dollars has been handed over. In Equatorial Guinea, where the president publicly hung his predecessor from a cage, suspended a theater before having shot. Chinese firms helping the dictator build an entirely new capital full of gleaming skyscrapers and, of course, Chinese restaurants. After battling for years against the white colonial powers of Britain, France, Belgium and Germany, post-independent lead African leaders are happy to do business with China for a straightforward reason, cash. Western loans linked to an insistence on democratic forms and need for transparency in using the money, diplomatic language for rules to ensure dictators do not pocket millions, the Chinese have proved much more relaxed about the, what their billions are used for. Certainly little of it reaches the continent's impoverished 800 million people. Much of it goes straight into the pockets of dictators. In Africa, corruption is a multi-billion pound industry, and many experts believe that China is fueling the cancer. The Chinese are contemptuous of such criticism. To them, Africa is about pragmatism, not human rights. Business is business, says Chinese Deputy Minister Minister Zhu Wenzhong, adding that Beijing should not interfere in internal affairs. We try to separate politics from business. While the bounty has not surprisingly, surprisingly been welcomed by African dictators, the people of Africa are less oppressed. At a market in Zimbabwe to, recently where Chinese goods were on sale at nearly every store, one woman told me she would not waste her money on Zing Zong products. They go Zing when they work, and then they quickly go Zong and break. She said, they're a waste of money. But there's nothing else. China is the only country that will do business with us. There have also been riots in Zambia, Angola, and Congo with a flood of Chinese immigrant workers. The Chinese do not use African labor where possible, saying black Africans are lazy and unskilled. In Angola, the government has agreed that 70% of tendered public works must go to Chinese firms, most of which do not employ Angolans. As well as enticing hundreds of thousands to sell in Africa, they have even shipped Chinese prisoners to produce the goods cheaply. In Kenya, for example, only 10 textile factories are still producing, compared with 200 factories five years ago as China undercuts locals in the production of African souvenirs. Where would it all end? As far as Beijing is concerned, it will stop only when Africa no longer has any minerals or oil to be extracted from the continent. A century after Sir Francis Galton outlined his vision for Africa, the Chinese here to stay, more will come. The people of this bewitching, beautiful continent where humankind first emerged from the Great Valley in desperate need progress. The Chinese are not here for that. They are here for plunder. After centuries of pain and war, Africa deserves better. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that. Please comment, rate, share, and subscribe. I'm going to leave this article in the description. If you'd like to support me, uh, if you'd like to support a channel, leave my GoFundMe in the description. If you'd like to follow me on Instagram, I'll leave it there as well. 
If you want to buy one of my t-shirts, I'll leave that there as well. Peace.